Um, we have our moderator, Eleanor Gordon-Smith, world-class debater, philosophy student, contributor to the Sydney Morning Herald, Oni Swa and the Drum, as well as past moderator of many Bass Tuesday talk series. We have, um, starting over here at my right, Dr. Christopher Hartney, a lecturer in new religious movements within religious studies at the University of Sydney. Um, the Reverend Michael Padgett, who is rector of St. Barnabas Broadway, and an Ang Anglican chaplain to UTS and the University of Sydney. Rabbi Jeffrey Cannons, Senior Rabbi at Emmanuel Synagogue, where he has been working since 1989. Chaplain with the Australian Army and a teacher and founding member of the Hebrew and Religious School and the Florence Melton Adult Mini School in Sydney. Mr. Jason Sabalo, a student in philosophy honours at the University of Sydney and Catholic apologist. Mr. Abdullah Kunda, Islamic apologist and debater, student of medicine at the University of New South Wales and Mr. Travis McKenna, who is previous Vice President of the Atheist Society at the University of Sydney and a PhD candidate in Renaissance Philosophy and part-time lecturer at the University. So if you could welcome the panelists. <coughs> We're going to have opening statements for each of our panellists now. I'd ask each of the panellists not to exceed five minutes, and if you do, I misplaced my desk bell, but I'll sorry if my throat. Uh, so to open the panellists' discussion, Chris. Thank you. Well, um, if God uh, is as big as everybody says he is, then um, he's got no trouble in the 21st century. And I also wonder, is it the case that uh, he has the potentiality to exist and not exist at the same time? Now, if he doesn't exist, that's how I worship him as an atheist. Um, um, there is within me uh, a very sense of mystical atheism. I'm a bad atheist. I sneak into the Catholic Mass sometimes because that's... That's, uh, that's how I grew up. Um, I go to Hindu temples. I feel something very special when I go there. I go into some of the beautiful mosques in Sydney, which is part of my job. I admire aspects of Scientologists because they hate malpractice among um, psychiatrists, so they go around shutting them down and do a very good job of shutting down very bad practice um, psychiatrists. So, do I want a world without God, um, a world without religion? Not really. But I would say at the same time that as far as God having a central and vital place in the ongoing progress of Western civilization, um, that battle was lost about 1789, and uh, Nietzsche confirmed it, uh, that God has moved into his own, as far as I understand it, of uh, an ability for people like me to have a bit of a, a spiritual moment from time to time, but come back into the secular world and exist in a secular world in the way that God in the 21st century will have to continue to exist in the whole paradigm of secularity. And that means, of course, that um, uh, technology will define how we understand him to an extent. And something that interests me is the surveillance state and the idea that we might understand God morally and ethically as uh, deus omni widens, the, the God that sees everything. But I think after the 20th century, it's very difficult to believe that he's uh, deus omnipotens, the God that has the power to do everything, because it's the state that is now doing everything for us, up to and including defining what a religion is, defining um, some of the social aspects of, of what is acceptable in um, believers' uh, paradigms of what they understand God is, and of course, why will religions and why will God continue to be restrained by the state? And that's because they take state money. Um, they are deeply implicated in the secular um, project. Uh, moreover, um, when we talk about moral issues such as abortion, for example, um, religious people will speak about those issues in terms of human rights, rights of the fetus and so forth, rights. It's not about religious authority now. They're not saying because the Pope said so. They're not saying because scripture uniquely justifies it. When they're arguing in public, they're arguing on a secular front level. So he's there. He will continue to be there. I think that religions and uh, the way that they support God will continue to be supported financially and conceptually by the state, that is the, the collective us, as it were, because um, there's an emotional outlet there for a lot of people. There's an engagement into community that a lot of people are able to get through 
um, through religion, and the state is eager to support that. But I think continually it will, or increasingly, move in the direction of um, that funding to religions will be there in the way that funding's there for opera and for ballet and a whole range of other things, that the state is giving us a, a diverse range, as it were, of emotive experiences. And so there will be a, a significant level of accommodation for God in the 21st century, but increasingly as a cultural manifestation, increasingly as a, um, a reference to uh, pre to the, to, to the Western world pre-1789 when uh, before the French Revolution we needed to know uh, or we need to know or have a conceptualization of what it means to be in a world where God is the state uh, and that's very much the case in a France under Louis XIV and so forth. Um, and so that idea of um, power and social operation is deeply engaged with the structure of what God means in a very deep collaborative effort, but of course after the revolution, after the enlightenment, and certainly after Nietzsche, and the horrors of the 20th century, God is now under the edges, as it were, of the secular state, and as such will slowly continue to lose power, slowly continue to lose um, his grip in a metaphysical way, and his grip in a um, um, uh, sort of epistemological way, but uh, as a cultural manifestation will continue to abide. And as I was saying before, a, myth, a mystical atheist, not a new atheist, a bad old atheist who's a bit, a bit shabby around the fringes, um, I think that uh, a world that simply ceases to be um, connected to um, this God, this Judeo-Christian God that I've been speaking about, is going to be a sad world, really. Um, so uh, a diminution of God as we go further into the 20th century, but, uh, um, but not a complete and immediate eradication because Dawkins said that it should be so. Yeah. Remarks and move one step down to the left of the table and welcome Reverend Mike Patrick. Thanks, Eleanor. And Chris, can I say what a joy it is to hear an atheist speak in metaphysics? Just beautiful. Uh, friends, uh, I'm a Christian. Um, because I'm a Christian, there's a way in which tonight's question has kind of a, a profound joy but also a sadness to it for me. Uh, I want to talk about the sadness first. Uh, if the churches talk about the God of Jesus Christ, is in any way reflective of the truth, uh, then I take it that taking at face value this question, now what place God in the 21st century, kind of in itself speaks of a tragic break with both reality and relationship. Uh, if there is in fact a perfect, kind and pure creator who holds us human beings to account for the way in which we treat uh, those whom he has made and that he loves, uh, who has promised to deal with our deepest problems and it is himself the consummation of our deepest desires who knows us as we fear being known and loves us as we long to be loved and who has dealt with our most deep existential crisis which is ourselves by sending his son Jesus to rescue us from ourselves. If that is true, then I think to ask the question, what place for God uh, betrays the same, same kind of relational low point as perhaps a unfaithful husband uh, asking himself, what place for my wife in this world of mine? But I don't want to speak all to the negatives. I want to speak to the positives of this question too. Uh, I think there are particular dimensions of our current context which I take it are, are relatively unique. Uh, so I want to intensify the question rather than diminishing it and, and perhaps ask this question, um, why should we be glad, joyful, excited, that the God of Jesus Christ is who he says he is in the 21st century of all times, in this century. And I want to suggest the reality of God as a story told in the Bible, I think a story which actually reflects reality at its deepest level, is in fact the best possible resource for responding to the unique dimensions of our time. Uh, and I just want to choose a really, I thought there will be a lot of uh, highfalutin talk tonight, and I thought let's just choose a really practical example. Let's talk about climate refugees, just as a little worked example. 
Uh, to deal with climate refugees, there is a growing consensus internationally that we will in fact need to limit growth, both for its environmental impact and to sustain those refugees. Overthrowing a whole economic belief system which is based on the idea of unending growth and in fact uh, effectively cut back on what we in the wealthy uh, developed world would call our quality of life. We'll have to give up some of our comfort and our power and our well-being for the sake of the weak. In other words, we'll need to abandon many of our rights for the sake of the move towards love, the love of the other, the love of the individual. Now, you may not be aware of this, but the notion of the inalienable right, the privilege, the preciousness of the individual derives entirely uh, in the Western world of thought from the biblical thought system. I know to be called, but the Bible tells us that we are made in God's image and that is why we are precious. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist, he hated this perspective. He despised Christianity. He saw this as the most corrosive contribution that Christianity made to the Western world. Uh, the care, as he put it, for the botched and the weak. But not all atheists have thought the same. Uh, Richard Rorty, the late great American philosopher and atheist, I want to read this. He imagines in one of his works a child found wandering in the woods, the remnant of a slaughtered nation, and he asks if such a person should have no share in human dignity, and he explains, it does not follow that she may be treated like an animal. For it is part of the tradition of our community that the human stranger from whom all dignity has been stripped is to be taken in, to be reclothed with dignity. This Jewish and Christian element in our tradition is gratefully invoked by freeloading atheists like myself. Now, I don't want to make this an issue of the whole question, can you be good without God? You clearly can. But I'm interested that Rorty says that this is a point, a heritage, a tradition which he gratefully invokes. Why grateful? I wonder if it's because the message of the gospel, which has somehow permeated through parts of our history, our culture of Jesus giving himself up for the cross and commanding us likewise to take up our crosses, actually frees us to embrace a constantly renewing view of humanity, a way to be human, to joyfully give without thinking of ourselves as good, to be good, sacrificially good, without becoming kind of horrible and mean if you know what I mean. Uh, and I want to suggest that in fact it is possible to do good without belief in God, but the cross of Christ, the, the narrative, the reality of God actually frees us from claiming we are good while we are doing good. It frees us to give of ourselves sacrificially, to be motivated, to be empowered towards us, and to do so joyfully and freely.